The compact crossover segment is an incredibly, incredibly hot segment right now. The top three players, the RAV4, the CRV, and the Ford Escape, are expected to each sell over 300,000 of these crossovers in the year 2016. With sales numbers like that, it is not surprising that Toyota went back and completely refreshed the RAV4 for the 2016 model year. Toyota's latest styling direction is definitely adventuresome and emotional, and I would love to know what you think about it down there in the comments section down below. In the past, Toyota has been accused of creating bland designs, and I think these more polarizing designs are definitely the right direction for the brand. Our model is the top-end limited trim, so we do get these full LED headlamps with LED daytime running lamps, fog lamps right down here, front parking sensors, a 360-degree camera, which employs this front camera right here, a camera on the back of the vehicle, and cameras on each of the side view mirrors to give you a bird's eye view of what you're driving over. We also have a radar sensor located right here behind this large Toyota logo because we now have adaptive of cruise control in the RAV4. At a hair under 180 inches long, the RAV4 is one of the larger entries in this segment. It is a hair shorter than something like a Nissan Rogue or a Jeep Cherokee, but it is a decent amount longer than a Hyundai Tucson or a Ford Escape. Side profiles really dictate interior volume, and that's where the RAV4 excels over some of the competition that's trying to go for a more swoopy profile. We have a glass that's relatively vertical in the back and a roof line that stays very horizontal as it goes rearward. That means we get a much squarer cargo area in the back of this than you find in some crossovers. Because this is a refresh, not a redesign, the major points in the RAV4 have stayed the same. So the overall dimensions of the vehicle are the same, the location of the doors, the location of the seats, etc. That also means that even though the rear end has been restyled for 2016, we still have this definite two-tiered look to the rear. These tail lamps have a very flat and upright surface right here, and then a very vertical surface right back here on the side. They don't actually stick out very far from the vehicle, although it does give that impression. And then this rear glass is actually set into the vehicle slightly. The overall styling of the rear is perhaps a little bit plain compared to some of the more aggressive entries in this segment, but it's all because Toyota has tried to give you a very practical cargo area. You can really see the overall height of this hatchback. It really goes quite close to the ground, meaning this bumper is quite thin. We do have parking sensors in the rear in our model, and all models have a single well-hidden exhaust tip. The design of the rear end in the RAV4 and this very tall hatch means that the cargo load floor is a little bit closer to the ground and the entry point is closer to the ground. However, on the downside, you do have to back up further from the vehicle in order to actually open this hatch without it bopping you in the face. That does mean if you're close quarters parallel parking, you have to get a little bit further away from that car behind you in order to load cargo in the back. This is still a 2.5 liter four-cylinder engine producing 176 horsepower. It's still mated to a six-speed automatic transmission and your choice of front-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. Fuel economy comes in at 26 miles per gallon combined for the front-wheel drive trim and 25 miles per gallon combined for the all-wheel drive trim. That's all pretty average for this segment. What's unusual for this segment, however, is that we finally have the return of a hybrid crossover vehicle, and you can find that in the 2016 RAV4 Hybrid. That RAV4 Hybrid uses a 2.5-liter four-cylinder-based hybrid system that's very similar to what we see in the Toyota Camry, producing 195 total horsepower. Now, if you want to know more about that hybrid RAV4, I will have a completely separate video on that coming up in a few weeks, so be sure and subscribe to this channel, and you'll see more about that later. The hybrid RAV4 has the distinction of not only being one of the more powerful entries in this segment, but also one of the most fuel efficient. It actually gets 34 miles per gallon in the city and over 30 miles per gallon combined. An important consideration with the RAV4 is the way the all-wheel drive systems work, because the gasoline models like we're driving here is fairly unique in this segment in that you can actually manually lock the center coupling. That's not something many of those crossovers out there allow you to do anymore. So even though we have just over six inches of ground clearance, which is notably below something like a Subaru Forester, this vehicle can actually lock the inputs for the front and rear differentials together. Now the RAV4 will only do that below about 25 miles an hour or so, but that's more than you find in most of the compact crossovers out there. The RAV4 Hybrid is also quite unique in this segment because it is available only with an E all-wheel drive system. And that means that the rear axle nut hybrid is electric powered only. The front axle can get up to 195 system horsepower. The rear axle is limited to just under 80 horsepower. That's very different than we find, for instance, in this vehicle, because if you engage that electric locking center clutch pack, you can actually send almost all the power to the rear wheels if the front wheels had zero traction. Front seat comfort is very good in the RAV4 thanks to a two-way adjustable lumbar support that we still don't find in every entry in this segment. Of course, our model is the limited model, so we do get upgraded seats, 
as well as a two position seat memory. On the downside, the tilt telescopic steering column does not have a very large range of motion that may make it a little bit more difficult for taller drivers to find a comfortable driving position. The rear seats in the RAV4 are surprisingly large, and in fact, you will find more room back here than you'll find in many mid-sized crossovers. These rear seats also recline. There's a lever right here on the seat. This is the most upright position, and then they recline to a quite reclined position for this category, actually. You can get fairly comfortable in the rear seats in the RAV4. Rear seat passengers get very generously sized cup holders. Interestingly enough, they're square, so that way you can actually put juice boxes in there a little bit more easily. The rear seats are soft, they're thickly padded. Over here on the right side of the vehicle, I have an enormous amount of legroom, even though this front seat is all the way back in its tracks. I also have a very generous amount of headroom, about two inches left here in the back, even though our model does have the sunroof. Now, the RAV4 does not have a panoramic sunroof like you will find in some of the competition. That does mean we get a little bit more headroom in the back. On the downside, the rear shoulder belt for the middle passenger comes out of the ceiling. I do find that a little bit less convenient than the shoulder belts that are integrated into the seat backs themselves. Because this is one of the larger crossovers in the segment, you can fit larger things in the back than you can in some of those other crossovers, namely items that are four feet wide. So you can put an item that's, for instance, about four feet by four feet in this vehicle. Now, it will have to be at a slight angle. You can't actually put it between the wheel wells like you would in a minivan, but you can actually get it in the back and you can't in every crossover out there. Because of the generous size of this cargo area, I'm going to give this 10 out of 10 points in my exclusive trunk comfort index. As we take a look at the interior, keep in mind we are in the top end limited trim. We do have height adjustable seat belts for both the driver and the front passenger, but you'll notice that we don't have a panoramic moonroof like we do see in some of the other options out there. The front seats are perhaps a little bit more heavily bolstered than you might expect in a Toyota, and they are in this two-tone pattern in our model. The front door panels are a combination of hard and soft touch plastics, so this large tan section right here is a soft touch plastic that matches the leather and matches a portion of the dashboard. Then we have hard touch plastics for basically everything else in the door panel. Because we're in the limited model, we have some imitation wood trim right there around the door lock button and the power window switch. Then moving down from there, you'll see that we also have a bottle holder and a storage cubby right next to the speaker grill. It may surprise some of you that the RAV4 has one of the more premium interiors in this segment, even though we have a decent amount of hard plastics going on. Toyota has taken a trick basically out of some of the Koreans' playbook and given us soft touch plastics where you reach and then hard touch plastics that are well out of reach. So this upper portion of the dashboard is a hard touch plastic, but this portion of the dashboard is actually a stitched piece of pleather. Zooming in on that, you can actually see the stitch work that pieces those two pieces of the dashboard together. And then there is a small storage cubby right here between these two air vents. We have a circular air vent over there and a rectangular one over here. Below this trim panel, we do have a large bin style glove compartment. I was able to fit a large tablet computer inside. The stitch panel continues all the way from the passenger side on over to the driver's side. The RAV4 does not have an air conditioning vent for the rear passengers, so instead Toyota puts one right here on the top portion of the dashboard that directs air right back there towards the rear. It also allows you a slightly more diffuse air output for the driver and the front passenger. Below that air vent, we have a hazard light button. We have the button to enable or disable our 360 degree camera or parking sensors, depending on what your vehicle is equipped with. We also have our traction control enable disable button right over there. We have two large air vents on either side of this infotainment and navigation system. This is basically the same system that we see in a variety of other Toyota models. The software is also very similar to what we see in certain Lexus models. If you want to know more about this infotainment system, go ahead and click that banner at the bottom of your screen. One of the unique features about Toyota's Entune system is that very much like Ford Sync, this offers full voice command of your USB connected media device. Below the screen is where you'll find the dual zone automatic climate control in our particular model. Below the stitch dashboard panel, you'll find the Eco Sport button, the heated seat controls for the driver and the front passenger seat if your vehicle is so equipped. We have two button blanks right over here and a USB and auxiliary input along with the power port. The USB input is not hidden away in some storage compartment. That does mean that your cable is out and so is your USB media device. In addition to this very large cup holder right here, we also have a triangular storage area and that storage well where the phone is sitting right there. Unlike some of the European companies, Toyota has definitely figured out that Americans like large sodas and the two cup holders up front are easily able to accommodate large takeout drinks. The shifter is a gated version, so we don't have a button or anything. We just pull it all the way down through the gates in order to get to drive, click it over to the left for sport mode, up for up, and down for down. Now, this is not a true manual mode. It's more of a sport automatic mode, but it does allow you some range of gear selection. Unusually, the RAV4 continues to use a traditional handbrake right over here, and then we have the second of the large cup holders between the front seats. You can see how deep that well is. It easily swallows this large takeout soda. Between the front seats, we have a large, softly padded center armrest. It does have two 
different dividers. So we have one section right there for wallets, that sort of thing. And then it opens to reveal a relatively deep storage well. You can fit a gallon of milk in here, but you can't actually close the lid. One thing you won't find in here, however, is an additional USB port. There's just one in the dash. On the driver's side, we have a lightly refreshed instrument cluster with a large tachometer and large speedometer. And then we have this color multifunction display in between. The display is controlled via this joystick button on the right side of the steering wheel. We go screen to screen using these side to side buttons through the options in the various screen with the up and down buttons, click to enter, back button, and of course, cycle through the trip computer with this trip button. As you'd expect, we have full multimedia information in the screen. We can also change sources, cycle through our various source inputs right there. We also have access to the safety information screen where you'll find information about the active safety systems that are available on the RAV4, vehicle messages if there was anything wrong. You can also change certain vehicle settings like turning on and off the blind spot monitoring system, the parking assistance settings, etc. We also have some displays that we haven't really seen in very many Toyota models before, like this all wheel drive screen that tells you where the power is going. There'd be little blue bars going up telling you which wheel is receiving the power. The steering wheel is a little bit thicker than I remember the last RAV4 we drove, and we do have sport grips right up top. This is a three-spoke design, and again we have those controls for controlling that multifunction display over here. As we've seen with other Toyota models, the cruise control is controlled via this stock right here on the steering wheel, and it does move with the wheel. And then of course this button right here on the steering wheel itself. This controls the set distance between you and the car in front of you if you do have the optional radar adaptive cruise control system, otherwise you would just have this stock that again turns with the wheel. On the left side of the wheel we have our volume up, down, track forward, backward. We have a button that changes the source as well as mutes the system, and a voice command button. To the left side of the steering wheel is where we find a very interesting button for a compact crossover. This does lock the center coupling, as I said earlier. This is quite unique. A lot of crossovers used to have a lock like this, but not very many do anymore. When I say the RAV4 can lock its center coupling, I mean it actually does lock the center coupling. So when we floor the vehicle like this out on this wet gravel road, you actually get instant traction. Now on the downside, you do get basically the same feeling that you get in any four wheel drive that has a locked center differential or locked center coupling. That means that you only want to use this system out here on gravel roads like this or on muddy roads or in snow, that sort of thing, because you can get some driveline binding and it can cause increased wear to certain drivetrain components, especially if you're going to do this on asphalt. So you really don't want to do this out on the street. Zero to 60 acceleration in the RAV4 is a little on the long side for this particular segment. We clock this at 8.9 seconds zero to 60. That is notably slower than the Escape in any of its engine variants, the CRV, the Rogue, etc. The Escape and the CX-5 with their largest engines are notably faster than this. The CRV is actually still a little bit faster than this, even though there is only that one engine offered. In an interesting twist, if you want better fuel economy and better performance, Toyota has the RAV4 Hybrid, and that will go from 0 to 60 about a second faster than the model we've been driving. Our 60 to 0 test came in at 127 feet, which is one of the shorter entries 60 to 0 in this particular segment, so I'm going to go ahead and give this a B+. The braking score of the RAV4 is definitely helped out by the wide tires that we see, especially in this limited trim. These are 235 width tires. These are wider than you find in a decent number of the competition. Now, even though we have wide tires on the RAV4, handling comes in a little bit below entries like the Escape, the CX-5, or even that new Tucson. The reason for that is that the RAV4 has a very compliant suspension. This is a very, very comfortable ride out here on the road, but as we frequently see, ride and handling are sort of two ends of the teeter-totter. And that means that in order to get the very supple ride that we see in this RAV4 that's obviously very comfortable for long car trips, we do have to give up a little bit when it comes to handling. Therefore, I'm going to go ahead and give the handling a B- and the ride an A+. This is definitely the kind of small crossover you want to take on a long cross-country trip, but it's not the kind of small crossover you really want to drive hard out here on these winding mountain roads. That's not to say that the RAV4 handles poorly by any stretch of the imagination. It just doesn't have that sharp, engaging feel that we see in something like top-end trims of the Escape or the Mazda CX-5. Now, the softer suspension in the RAV4 may be a problem out on paved road, but out here on this gravel road, the softer suspension really soaks up these bumps in the road very, very well. That does make this one of the most comfortable entries in this segment. In terms of cabin noise, we scored 70 decibels at 50 miles an hour in this RAV4. That does make this a little bit louder than the CRV, but definitely Definitely quieter, especially than some of the older entries in the segment. Something like the Subaru Forester or the current generation Kia Sportage, they're going to be louder than this out on the road. Now the RAV4 does transmit a decent amount of engine noise into the cabin. That's something that surprised me because overall, ride and wind noise are very, very well controlled. 
When it comes to fuel economy, we have been averaging 24.5 miles per gallon in this top-end RAV4 all-wheel drive. Keep in mind that this is the heaviest non-hybrid version available and that does affect your fuel economy. We also have those wide 235 width tires. You will find better fuel economy in the all-wheel drive versions of the Mazda CX-5 and the Hyundai Tucson thanks to a very efficient engine in the Mazda and a very efficient transmission over there in the Hyundai. Of course, if you want the best fuel economy in an all-wheel drive entry in this segment, then you look no further than the RAV4 itself because there is that brand new hybrid model. And the brand new hybrid model gets over 30 miles per gallon in the city over 30 miles per gallon on the highway and over 30 miles per gallon combined. It simply can't be touched by any of the other entries in this segment. Interestingly enough, the hybrid also improves the acceleration score in this vehicle, and it does drop about a second off the zero to 60 time. So even though I give this vehicle a C minus when it comes to acceleration, the hybrid model actually improves that to an A minus. Overall, the RAV4 is not exactly my cup of tea behind the wheel. The steering is a little bit vague. It's a little bit over boosted. The ride is a little bit soft. However, if you're looking for something that's more comfortable out on the road than your average compact crossover, this is definitely something you want to look at. Toyota has priced the 2016 RAV4 very well for this segment. It starts at $23,680 for the base LE model, and if you add all the options up like we're seeing basically in the model we've been looking at, you'll end up right around $35,230. The model we've been looking at today is an essentially fully loaded limited trim with all-wheel drive. If you want the hybrid, you'll find it in the XLE and the limited trims for about an extra $2,100. Now I will have another video specifically on the RAV4 hybrid coming up in the next few weeks, so be sure and stay tuned for that. I suspect that the average RAV4 shopper will be more interested in a well-equipped XLE. For about $30,925, you can get an all-wheel drive XLE model with blind spot monitoring, cross traffic detection, the front and the rear parking sensors, and navigation. Because there are so many compact crossovers available in the United States, there are a ton of competitors for the RAV4 that are very, very direct competitors, and there are, of course, a ton of competitors that are a little bit off to each side. So we're going to breeze through the competition very, very rapidly. Obviously, the first competitor is going to be Honda's CRV. The RAV4 and the CRV have been duking it out for the same sort of customer for a very long time. In this particular segment, you can definitely see that going on because both of them are now available with some of the advanced safety packages and features that we only saw in luxury cars a few years ago. The RAV4 has perhaps a more traditional feel. It does have that traditional six-speed automatic transmission. It also has that locking center coupling. That's going to make this feel definitely more sure-footed in snow and slippery conditions than you'll find in the CRV. The CRV has recently taken an awful lot of flack for its all-wheel drive system, which not only does not have a locking mode, but it has failed certain European tests. Now, personally, I don't really agree with those European tests. I actually think that their concept is flawed. However, this does pass that particular test and the CRV does not, if that really matters to you. This is going to feel more sure-footed in snow and in mud, that sort of thing, than the CRV. But for the average surfaces that average people will be driving on, you're not going to notice too much of a difference. The RAV4 has a very, very large trunk, and I also think it has a slightly nicer dashboard design than the current generation CRV. I did find the CRV's driver's seat to be a little bit more comfortable, but the back seats are very, very comparable. The three big differences for me between the CRV and the RAV4 is that the CRV is faster to 60 than this model, although the braking is right about the same. Fuel economy in the CRV is also a little bit better than the RAV4 thanks to its continuously variable transmission. Some people don't like CVTs, but they do have a benefit, especially when we're talking about vehicles like this. Lastly, of course, we do have the RAV4 hybrid because again, the CRV is going to be more expensive than the RAV4. So about the same price you'll pay for a hybrid RAV4 like this, you'll actually find a gasoline CRV. And although the CRV does get you slightly better gas mileage than this model that we've been looking at, the hybrid beats them both. Ford's Escape is right around the same price as the RAV4. It is, however, getting a little bit old these days. It has been on the market for some time, and it hasn't been refreshed like the RAV4 has. You will find two turbocharged engines in the Escape, and both of them will be faster 0-60 to 60 than this RAV4. The Escape also handles a little bit better. However, the Escape is a decent amount smaller on the inside. It's very noticeable in the back seat and in the cargo area. The fuel economy in the Escape also leaves a little bit to be desired. The current generation Hyundai Tucson disappointed me a little bit the last time we tested it, largely because of the way that Hyundai has chosen to package options in that vehicle. You don't get things like leather seats until you're in the top end trim. That means that the comparison between the Tucson and the RAV4 XLE trim that I was mentioning, you will find a better deal over here in the Toyota than you will in the Hyundai. You'll also definitely find a nicer interior inside this cabin than in the Hyundai, and that actually surprised me a little bit because lately Hyundai has been making some very, very nice interiors. And I think that the Tucson is almost a step backwards. 
We really don't know what the new Kia Sportage is going to look like, but you can expect it to drive, accelerate, and brake very, very similarly to the Hyundai. Now, based on Kia's track record, I do expect the Sportage to be priced very aggressively. However, I am a little bit concerned about its interior based on what we did see in the current generation Hyundai Tucson. Therefore, I'm suspecting it may be a little bit of a tie with the RAV4. It probably will handle a little bit better and accelerate a little bit better than the RAV4, may not ride quite as nicely, the interior may be a mixed bag. Definitely stay tuned, however, because I will be taking a look at that model in about three weeks. Nissan's Rogue is one of the softer and more comfortable entries in this segment. It also is a little bit more fuel efficient than this RAV4, largely because of its CVT. Now, it does have the option of the third row seat, which we used to see in the RAV4, but we don't anymore. Now, on the downside, if you want that third row option in the Rogue, you will pay more for it than, of course, this RAV4 over here, and you will lose your spare tire in the back. The Rogue scoots to 60 a little bit faster than the RAV4. The braking takes a little bit longer, however, and the handling is right about the same. Although Nissan's latest infotainment system does not seem to be as well thought out as we find over here in the Toyota, that Rogue is a little bit less expensive. There are two entries in this segment that really march to a different drummer, but everybody seems to want to talk about them, so let's talk about the Jeep Cherokee and the Subaru Forester. The Forester is a little tricky because it is very, very inexpensive for this particular segment, and all models come with standard all-wheel drive. That means that when you're taking a look at that base Forester versus a front-wheel drive base RAV4, you do have to effectively add about $1,800 to the price of your Toyota RAV4 in order to be comparable for that base model. And when you do that, you'll notice that there is a big, big difference between the Toyota and the Subaru. The Subaru is much, much less expensive. Now, when you hop inside the Subaru, the reason for that less expensive price tag will be obvious. Its interior is not going to be as nice as the base RAV4. It's a little bit louder on the road, and there is a CVT, of course, rather than a traditional six-speed automatic transmission. On the flip side, of course, we do get that standard all-wheel drive, and it is an incredible value because the price tag is so low. Subaru has been very, very aggressive with their pricing lately because in order to compete in this particular segment where everybody else has standard front-wheel drive and they have standard all-wheel drive, they've had to effectively lower that all-wheel drive price tag down to the point where it's much more similar to the front-wheel drive entries like this RAV4. Now, when it comes to all-wheel drive performance, the Subaru and the Toyota RAV4 will actually be quite similar unless you're taking a look at the RAV4 Hybrid. That's because this model does have that lockable center coupling. You can actually manually lock it up to about 25 miles an hour, and therefore it will always send 50% of the power to the rear wheels. Depending on exactly what's going on with the all-wheel drive system, this vehicle can also send almost all of the power to the rear wheels. That's a little bit different than we see in the Subaru. The Subaru is trying to keep about 60% of the power up front, 40% of the power to the rear, and at this time there is no option to lock that center coupling manually. Now, Subaru's all-wheel drive system does seem to be a little bit faster reacting to various situations, so it's likely going to be more sure-footed in the snow than this RAV4 at higher speeds, but below about 25 miles an hour with the coupling locked in this model, it's actually going to be very, very similar. This lockable center coupling is also an area where you can compare this with the Jeep Cherokee. The Jeep Cherokee is sort of an odd entry in this segment because it does compete with things like this Toyota RAV4, but it was also designed to replace the Jeep Liberty, which was a true off-road vehicle. The Cherokee actually has a two-speed transfer case, very much like you see in Land Rover and Range Rover models. The Cherokee and the Forester also have more ground clearance than we find in the RAV4, and the front and rear of the vehicle was designed for approach and departure angles in mind. It's obvious when you take a look at the general design of the Cherokee that off-roading was in mind, because we have a front end and a back end that was obviously designed for approach and departure angles. That's one area where the Subaru and the Jeep diverge. They both have very tall ground clearance figures, but the Cherokee does have more advantageous approach, breakover, and departure angles. Toyota's reliability and dependability reputation cannot be ignored in this segment, and those are free frequently cited reasons for people choosing the RAV4 over some of the competition. Now, personally, I would take the Mazda CX-5 over this because I do like the way its interior is done. I think it's more attractive on the outside. It also is an awful lot of fun to drive. Now, my top pick in this particular segment is the Mazda CX-5. It handles better than the RAV4. It also handles better than almost every other entry in this segment. It still delivers excellent fuel economy, and I really like the exterior and the interior look of that Mazda. But even I will have to agree that the RAV4 is likely going to be more reliable, more dependable. It's probably going to have better resale value, and maintenance costs are also likely going to be lower than many of the competition. I know some reviewers gloss over that, and a lot of you have even accused me of glossing over dependability and reliability in the past, 
but the average RAV4 shopper seems to be very concerned about dependability and reliability. So even though this does not handle quite as well as some of the competition, it does not handle badly by any stretch of the imagination. Even though this is slower to 60 than a lot of the competition, it is still acceptably fast for a family car. But this is going to be more reliable than some of those more fun options out there. And at the end of the day, some people frankly are more interested in that, and that's not really a problem.